Ladies and gentlemen, uh, forgive me for interrupting conversations, but uh, we have a, a relatively tight schedule and we have so many interesting ideas to explore with each other today. And so I wanted to get started. Um, thank you all for coming. We're delighted that you're here. And uh, I especially would like to thank Kamal Dervish for taking time out of his calendar to fit us in. He is fitting us in midway between a flight from from Arkansas to Mozambique. And I don't know how to, you know, I guess we're on the way. I'm not sure about that. But, it's, but I'm sure delighted that there was a little bit of a rest period and a downtime for Kamal to join us. He's a, a, a very familiar figure to Washington, of course, uh, having been at the World Bank and a, a, a respected individual in the international community, leader in the international community here for many years. Um, he knows America very well, uh, having taken his PhD and taught here uh, at Princeton. And I think it's someone who does know America well and genuinely has affection for America that can also speak the truth when we need to hear it. And it's been in that capacity that we've come to admire uh, Kamal so much for these recent years. Um, he is uh, now, of course, at UNDP and uh, an astoundingly important aspect of the United Nations complex. Uh, and the, the UN needed to bring in a deep, respected professional to head up this activity. And they're lucky to have him, and we're all, as uh, citizens of the world, we're lucky to have him doing this right now. Now, let me just say a, a word before I turn it over to, to Karen. Um, why did we ask him to come down to be with us under this Smart Power series? You know, and uh, the, the Smart Power lecture series is about how America finds its way back as a wanted international leader. You know, uh, rather than just kicking our way in through the door because we're so big, we would like to again be invited in. And how do we do that? Uh, and in no small measure, it rests with a rediscovering something that's really deep in our fiber, but it's somewhat been masked in recent years, especially after 9-11. Uh, we as a nation took the lead at one time in establishing international institutions to solve global problems. You know, we kind of fell out of love with those institutions over the last 10 to 15 years. And we found that it was a lot easier to pull together a coalition of the willing to go off and do something than it was to work inside an institution, frustrating as that will be. But institutions are the basis under which succeeding generations learn how to start and behave responsibly in the world. You know, coalitions of the willing don't establish the normative pattern for the next problem. Institutions do. So part of this smart power program is for us in Washington to rediscover the crucial role that the international institutions play in our national interest. Now, we don't expect that to be the focus of Dr. Dervish's presentation today. We expect him to be speaking to the importance of the UNDP for the world. But those Americans here, who are sitting here, we need to be listening to this as to why it's in our interest as well, not just for the sake of the UN or for the sake of the world community. And no one can do that better than Kamal Dervish. So Kamal, thank you for giving us this opportunity. We're, we've been looking Good forward to, to this. We're excited to have you. Karen, let me turn it to you to get us started here. And I think you... Okay. Do you want to say a few <laughs> words and then we're going to turn it over to Kamal for his yeah, presentation. Sure. sure. How well, do you want to do it? You yeah, go ahead. Well, why don't we um, maybe hear the presentation first. I'm Karen Von Hippel. I'm the co-director of the Post-Conflict Reconstruction Project here at CSIS, and we're delighted to hear you speak. We, we'll have to finish exactly at 2.30, so please um, be considering your questions now and try to be as precise as possible. So please, thank you All very right. much. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. It's great to be at CSIS. I've been here quite a few times in, over the last 25 years or so. I um, did my PhD at Princeton and then taught in Turkey for a while and then I got enough, I was working on general equilibrium models of growth and trade 
and got an offer from the World Bank to join the research department for a year. And I said, why not? One year, you know, at the World Bank should be great. And of course, that year ended up being 21 years. <laughs> and the World Bank is a great institution, and um, it, it is one of those international institutions that you referred to, which I think has a very critical role to play in, in international affairs and in developments, as does the UNDP, as does the IMF. And so I have been quite part of all this for, for the most part of my life. I then did go back to Turkey and joined the government during the financial crisis and was the minister, secretary of the treasury there and then joined parliament. And one thing I always share is that in a way moving from the World Bank to the Department of the Treasury in Turkey, of course it was a big change. But you know, it was still uh, in, a, in an organization, in a structured place, in, when I asked for, it was, and it wasn't really politics, it was trying to take care of the economy. The real change was when I came to parliament in the opposition. <laughs> that was a totally different kind of phase of life. But anyway, that's not the topic for us here. What I want to share with you really is two or three key points on, on the development challenge ahead of us and, and of course international institutions and that challenge. And if that has some relevance to US policy, of course, that, that will be good. I won't focus specifically on US policy, you know, as head of the United Nations Development Program. It's really not my, uh, you know, job in a sense to, to speak directly to the policies of individual countries, but I, I would like to share with you where, where I feel the biggest challenges are and some of the avenues, some of the areas of work and concentration which I think are particularly important in the years ahead. And of course the U.S. will play a tremendous role. Before I joined the UNDP, I did write a book at the Center for Global Development called A Better Globalization. There is the last chapter in there. There is a section, you know, focusing specifically on the U.S. So for those of you who are interested, it's one of those books you can download from the website. Not great for authors, but a modern age, you know. And uh, there, there is a whole section there, really. There's one section on the U.S., one on Europe, um, specifically focusing on, on the EU and, and U.S. Now, I think one thing when you look at development, big picture, is that you have this amazing phenomenon of both tremendous convergence and divergence. Both things are happening. I'm, I, I'm not going to use slides today. Uh, it's going to be more informal, but we should all, I'm sure many of you have seen these figures or these slides. We often forget that what we call development, growth, economic growth, is a relatively modern phenomenon in history. It all started around the 1800s until about 1800, 1820, actually for centuries, the per capita income, as has been estimated by various economic historians in the world, was pretty much the same you know, for 2,000 years or more. So it's, it's something that one, one, you know, one often forgets, that the world was basically not growing economically for centuries and centuries and centuries. And then with the Industrial Revolution, uh, with the development of, of that new technology, all of a sudden growth started the way we, we know it, the way we think about it and accelerated, in fact, over time with a major setback with the First World War, the Depression years and the Second World War, but broadly speaking, accelerating over time and indeed still accelerating. If you take uh, GD, world GDP by adding countries and weighing countries by their own individual GDPs, growth in the, this beginning of the 21st century is as rapid as it has ever been in per capita terms, um, except for some period after the Second World War, you know, the big reconstruction period in Europe, the Marshall Plan and also uh, the Soviet reconstruction, Japanese reconstruction, that gave a big boost to growth uh, during that period. But apart from that period, growth in the world is as rapid on aggregate as it has ever been. If you actually weigh countries by, by their populations rather than by their incomes, it is much more rapid than we've ever seen. So in that sense, we are in, in, in many ways experiencing the most rapid economic development in the world ever experienced. More people are being lifted out of poverty 
have been lifted out of poverty in the last two, three decades than, than ever before by a big margin. If we take the 10 most successful countries among the developing countries and compare them to the 10 richest, most advanced countries in the world, we will see that there was a divergence. The ratio of their per capita incomes was three in 1820, and then it grew, there was an overall divergence during the colonial and imperial period, if you like. The ratio became more like six, seven. However, after the Second World War, that ratio started to decline and is now back at three. So if you take that particular group of countries, you've had convergence. Okay? You have convergence with a large number of countries and large number of people Globalization, in that sense, is leading to convergence and is leading to narrowing the gap between developing countries and rich countries. And the countries I'm talking about here, of course, are China, the Republic of Korea, India now is growing very rapidly, some countries in Latin America, such as Chile, Turkey, and some other countries. You know, These are the kind of fast-growing emerging market economies that are catching up. So in that sense, you, you could say, well, you know, globalization is working. Globalization is actually leading to inclusive growth and to convergence. However, then, if you look at another group of countries, and I'm sure many of you have read uh, the new book by Paul Collier, The Bottom Billion, and he focuses very much on that. Those countries are diverging and continuing to diverge. There's one article by Lan Pritchett, who I think is now teaching at Harvard, who used to be at the World Bank, who called it divergence big time. If you take that, that ratio, which was also around three, and take it over the last two centuries, it has grown, the, the, the gap has grown from three to 50. So while you know, the other countries are catching up and the ratio is back to about three, the poorest countries, the poorest 10 countries, their ratio the ratio of the rich country per capita incomes to those countries per capita income has moved steadily up, never converging, never you know, a period where they were actually getting closer. And it has, has reached now the, really the dramatic ratio of 50, 50 times as po uh, poorer than, than, than the richest country. So in that sense, globalization is not working. There's a whole number of countries that are left out. And it even seems that globalization kind of wor is working against them. Uh, and I'm going to try to get back to that. And of course, that, term, that is a huge challenge uh, to all of us uh, in terms of security, in terms of ethics, in terms of human solidarity, and, and other things. And of course, the, you know, well, I, I'll get back also to the, to the security aspect of that, which I think is one of the important dimensions. So of course, for economists, you know, and I'm an economist, basically, at least still trying to hang in there as a professional economist, you know, with all the bureaucracy. But, <laughs> you know, it's of course the big, big question. Why is it that a country like the Republic of Korea, you know, in a lifetime, in the lifetime of one person, made it from an extremely poor rural economy to an industrial powerhouse and very prosperous country within a lifetime? There was a World Bank mission that went to Korea in the late 50s and came back and wrote a report saying, pretty hopeless. You know, these, this country just is going to be rural. They have no resources. They, nothing will happen here for a long time. So, you, you know, we can all be very, very wrong. Uh, so why, what, what's happening? Now, from an economics point of view, I, I won't go get into the, into the uh, details or, or the theoretical aspects, but, but intuitively, there, there, there are kind of two basic models that help us think about that. One model is the kind of neoclassical trade model. It's called the heckscher olin model in, in economic theory, where basically the assumption is that differences in income across countries are explained by capital accumulation, by the amount of capital countries have accumulated. And if you, if you think of the world as two countries, a rich north with a lot of capital and little labor, and a poor south with a lot of labor and a little capital, and then you open that model to trade and to capital flows, what will happen is that capital will flow from north to south 
taking advantage of the more plentiful labor and lower costs. Trade will actually accelerate that because trade in many ways you know, is, a, is an embodied version of capital flows. When you, when you export capital intensive products, you're actually exporting capital. When you export labor intensive products, it's as if you were exporting your labor. So trade and, and, and factor flows are actually quite similar. And the, the broad conclusion of that model is that globalization, in other words, the opening of borders to trade and, and capital flows, will equalize incomes and will generate convergence. Okay? It will make, take some time. It may not be perfect and instantaneous. But if you think in those neoclassical terms, globalization leads to convergence. And in, indeed, you know, many questions, many people will ask, well, why isn't this convergence faster? However, then looking at China, looking at India, looking at the Republic of Korea, looking at other countries, um, such as Turkey these days, which is a country also growing very rapidly, you can see that convergence taking place. And you can also see another dimension of the neoclassical trade theory, which is the factor price equalization theorem, which says that globalization will help the factors that are less available in their respective countries. Okay? So in a sense, it will help capital in the north because it will take advantage of the uh, more plentiful labor that's now entering the world economy. And some people are now thinking of the world economy with another billion people participating, mainly from China and India, in the labor force. But it will put downward pressure on the wages of the labor in the advanced countries because now they are competing much more immediately with the wages and salaries in the south. And the opposite is also true. It will benefit labor in the south but will put downward pressure on the returns in the south because now more capital is available to the south as it is coming from the north. So you have equalization of, of returns and broad convergence. So why isn't that working for another part of the world? Why isn't that working for the bottom billion or the 50 countries where the bottom billion lives? Many of them in Africa, but not at all all in Africa. Some in Central America, a country like Haiti, in the Caribbean, um, other countries, some countries in, in Asia are fit that uh, you know, left out category. And here, you know, th there's another model people think of in, in, in the backs of their minds. And that's the model. In, in the first model, the assumption is that technology, the same technology, is available everywhere. Now, by technology, I don't mean just the engineering knowledge. I also mean the broader concept of institutional capability, of the rule of law, of institutions that work. And if you think of technology in those terms, um, the conclusions that I talked about in the, about the neoclassical model are valid because the same technology is available you know, in the DRC Congo and in Chicago. It's just a question of taking it there. But you know, it's not nothing impossible to do. Whereas in, in a model where you basically have this technology that is not easily transferable, okay, then all the conclusions of the models change. And indeed, if the so-called technologies are far enough apart, in other words, if the institutional quality, the know-how, the rule of law, and of course the engineering technology, you know, all this set of things are so much more developed in the north compared to the south, then irrespective of the amount of capital excess in the north that would like to go to the south, you know, if it, if it wasn't for that, in fact it won't happen. Because in a, in a sense all factors are more productive in the north. And if you, if you build a model, you know, in an extreme form like that, you actually have the have the conclusion that the South will empty out. Capital and labor in the South will all want to go North. A very different, different, different conclusion from the neoclassical vision where capital flows South. So I think these models help one to think like all models, they're extremes, there's oversimplified reality is much more complex, there's no such thing as the North and the South, obviously it's much more complex. But they help us think, I think, about some of these big issues. 
And I think they help us stress, and they've helped that with the experience we've had in the, in the past, you know, in terms of decades of economic growth. They show that quality of institutions, know-how, rule of law, governance, these are key factors in development that are actually more important than the sheer amount of capital. We've had many countries that actually have made tremendous efforts at capital accumulation only to end nowhere. In fact, the Soviet Union was one example. The Soviet Union invested 45% of its GDP for decades. I remember when I was at Princeton in the library reading an article by um, Samuelson, it was, yeah, saying, you know, at the end of the day, we all have to get ready in the US. The Soviets are going to overtake us. Because we're only investing 20% of our, of, of our income, and they're investing 45%. So if you project that forward for decades, uh, there, there is the, you know, there's the kind of inevitability of Soviet income uh, surpassing American income. And I, you know, I puzzled over that and wondered whether it was correct or not. And it was quite a challenge, you know, because you know, if you like democracy, then you think people should be free to save and invest the way they wish, and you know, the state shouldn't be doing everything. On the other hand, from somebody, for somebody coming from a poor country, you know, a statement by, by economy, uh, economists saying that you know, if, if you don't invest and you, if the state doesn't force you to invest, you'll, you'll be left behind was, was quite a challenge. Well, the fact is, of course, it didn't happen. And I think the fact that it didn't happen has to do with this essential importance of institutions, of allocation, of efficiency, and not just the amount of resources that, that, you, that you spend. Now, having said that, looking ahead and looking at this development challenge and, and looking at where, what we're all trying to do, I'm not trying to say that resources are not important. Some resources obviously are important. And it's, again, these are not, I don't want to make extreme statements. But it is quite clear from all the theory as well as the experience we have over decades of development that if these resources are not combined with economic and governance reforms with policies which, which allow these resources to, to be used well. If uh, these institutions are not built in a sustainable way, then resources alone won't do the trick. That is true for oil money. There are many oil-rich countries that we've seen that you know, basically have wasted a lot of their oil money. It's also true for foreign aid. And of course, I am all in favor of foreign aid. I'm all, uh, I think there's need for more development assistance, need for more uh, assistance to the poorest countries. However, I also, I think, believe and, and, and understand that that amount of aid by itself is not enough. The real question is, how, how is it going to be used? And, uh, and that's what, in a sense, in many ways, UNDP is all about, because we are not uh, an organization that has lots of money to, to distribute. Donors give us some money, but it's basically for capacity building, institution building, technical assistance. It's not like the World Bank or the IMF for actual large financial support. The objective is try to help countries build these institutions, uh, build these capabilities. I think the same is true these days now for most of the bilateral aid. I mean, increasingly, uh, bilateral donors have also realized that it's the capacity building, the institution building that is so important. And I would say in terms of U.S. aid programs and you know, U.S. approach to developing countries, augmenting that aid, and the U.S., as you know, is of course in percentage terms quite a bit lower than quite a few other countries, rich countries, augmenting both the, the amount somewhat but also, m even more important, focusing on the quality of that aid and how to, how to make it work on what, what I call you know, technology. But I don't mean by technology, just engineering technology. I mean the whole human institutional setup that, that leads to development. And that's tough. That's very, very tough. It's much easier to go and build a road or a port or a factory than it is to help countries build stronger institutions that are sustainable. It's much easier to just make a balance of payment support loan than to really worry about these institutional development features. So now let me say a few words in, in, in that context. 
first, this institution building has to be uh, taking place with a domestic and national dynamic. It really is not something you can import from abroad. Countries are too different. Geography, history, culture, specific circumstances, politics are too different for institutions just to be transplanted. And I think, therefore, the country-driven nature of development strategies, the, the, the variety, the diversity that's there, and, and the, the need to adapt to that diversity, I think, is very, very important. My colleague and, and countryman, Danny Roderick, actually, has often you know, kind of written these days about development as self-discovery. And I think what he means there, very rightly, is that each country has to kind of chart its path. And, there, and, and recipes that just kind of fall from, from outside really don't work. That doesn't mean, of course, that sharing experiences and trying to adapt these experiences to local circumstances is not useful. And here I do believe, yes, comparative analysis, analyzing other countries' successes and, and failures, uh, deriving lessons from there and adapting them to, to your own domestic circumstances is, is a lot of what we can help countries do because we have the global network, we have the knowledge, we, we have staff that work in Peru, then from Peru go to Indonesia, and then from Indonesia go to Senegal. You know, that is invaluable in terms of bringing that experience. But it has to be in that spirit of working with local national dynamics and, and not certainly not believing that you can just take one model and transplant it somewhere else. I think this is one, one thing I would like to say which is very, very important. Second, and it's a dilemma often, is the issue of, in particular in the poorest countries, making sure that it's the domestic institutions that increasingly deliver the development services, whether it's procurement, whether it's planning processes, budgeting process. There's always a temptation for us at UNDP, as well as for the World Bank and, and bilateral donors, to kind of go there and do it ourselves. And sometimes it's necessary. You know, when there's an earthquake, everything is destroyed. Pakistan, two years ago, one has to rush in, humanitarian organizations, whatever, distribute the food, set up the tents, you know, whatever. You can't wait for the domestic. I mean, there, there are moments when immediate action is necessary, particularly in immediate post-crisis situations. But as you get out of the immediate post-crisis mode, I think it is important to have the focus and, and, and the will to work with the domestic institutions. And sometimes things go a little more slowly. But I think you know, it's, it's worth showing that patience if you want to have longer term results. Um, it's a debate that took place particularly uh, two, three years ago in Afghanistan, where you know, such a large international donor community is active. So many outside organizations are active. And at the same time, Afghanistan is trying to build, you know, rebuild itself as a, as a state, rebuild its own national institutions, very limited resources. You have the usual challenges of Afghan citizens working for the UN or the World Bank or USAID or, you know, Swedish development, maybe making five or ten times more salary than those who work for their own government. The result is that very often nobody is left in the government with any real skills. And President Karzai you know, complained about that to the donor community uh, two years ago during the London donors meeting. So I think it, it is very, very important to focus on these domestic capacities. It's difficult, takes time. One has to deal with the whole transparency issue. Um, UNDP faces that choice quite uh, dramatically at times. You know, we have two modes of executing projects. One is we do it ourselves and we use our own procurement methods and hopefully, you know, those are tight and we, we have a good supervision of what's going on. When it's national execution, it's the national authorities who do it. And of course, we try to help them and I'm sure they try to do it as best they can. But, um, you know, there are some real weaknesses at times in, in some of the poorest countries in particular. So I think this focus on, on building the institutions rather than trying to do it yourself, I think, is, is very important and showing the patience for that. Including, and I really want to underline that, dealing with the salary challenge. 
I visited some countries in Africa where very high level civil servants get a salary of 50 or 60 dollars a month. And you know, in today's world, of much more communication, borders, I'm going to come to borders later, but where, you know, where, you ha where skilled people, skilled people have opportunities abroad. If you want to build national capacity and national governance, you have to face the fact that you have to pay civil servants a decent wage. I mean, it cannot be in a poor country a very high wage, but it has to be enough to allow them a decent life and allow them to take care of their families, take care of the education needs of their kids, and so on. And so uh, that, that, that element, you know, uh, one cannot forget. And I don't think the donor community is doing enough on this. Still, there's more emphasis on hardware and not enough, or on just foreign technical assistance, you know, foreign technicians flying in and flying out, rather than really trying to build the national capacity of, of the poorest countries, including supporting salary structures, which allow governments to function. So that, that's the second point I'd like to make. Connected to that point, by the way, there is also the issue, and I'll, I'll come back to that, of um, nationals who have migrated and trying to bring them back. That sometimes can be a very effective way of getting skills, but skills that are connected to the country culturally to be more productive in, in, in their own country. And we, we ourselves at UNDP are working on, on various schemes of that sort. Last week, we actually launched a new partnership for democratic governance with quite a few countries, including the United States. Secretary Condoleezza Rice was in New York, and uh, we, did it, we did it together with the OECD, which is exactly focusing on providing skilled inputs into governance and into, into, into capacity of states to regulate and to distribute public services. And during my presentation, I gave the example of Japan, who uh, we, uh, Japan was a country, and I, I didn't know about this, actually I found out rather recently, but in the 19th century, Japan invited foreign experts, but with a condition. They had to stay 10 to 15 years. None of that two-week you know, mission, which I'm about to do from Mozambique. But, uh, you know, but uh, you, know, you really had to go and kind of live there and almost become Japanese. But of course, it was already a strong state, and lots of skills were actually formed in that period. It was entirely a nationally driven program. Japan was not abdicating its, its governance and leadership responsibility to foreigners, but it was bringing the foreigners in and asking them to stay. My own country, Turkey, in the 30s, did something somewhat similar and invited a lot of experts, particularly people who unfortunately were beginning to be persecuted in Europe, in Nazi Germany particularly, to Turkey and gave very, very important jobs to, to them. The founder of the, particularly also in academia, the founder of Istanbul University Economics Department was a German professor, Professor Neumach, who did a fantastic job in, in, in launching the whole kind of modern economics faculty uh, in, in Istanbul. So there are, there are examples of that, but I think, again, it's important to do it in, in, a, in a spirit of national capacity building and not, uh, you know, not letting, uh, it's not the foreigners doing the work, but it's, it's really the outside skill helping the national capacity. Now, a fourth point I'd like to make in, in, in that context, which is quite important, is, is how we handle migration. And here, I think a lot of work is needed. It's an extremely important feature of globalization. It's, of course, a huge debate now in the, in the States. I, I realize that. I haven't followed all the details in Congress, all the bills and, and things of that sort. But I find that uh, you know, capital flows and financial flows have been analyzed in, in great depth. And there are millions of articles and hundreds, thousands, thousands of books on it. Migration is, is a little bit less analyzed. And yet, it is so important because at the end of the day, at the center of national capacity are people. We say institutions, but you know, what is an institution? An institution is some way that teams work together in a legitimate and sustainable way that kind of reproduces itself so that if one person disappears, you know, the thing still functions. And, 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 and so it's bringing people together, bringing teams together. And here, to analyze how we do this in conjunction with international migration, I think is, is a very in interesting topic. 
I have a very personal, I mean, this is not UNDP policy, you know, UNDP official proposal or say, but I believe we, we must look at migration in a much more cooperative way. Not each country looking at purely from its own point of view, but really looking at the global economy, global needs, and, and then look at migration regulation, migration legislation in, in that context. Uh, and one has to be creative. And of course, one has to distinguish between skilled, unskilled. There are many, many different uh, variations of it. But let's take the very tough issue of nurses. I mean, I, we know that in Africa, uh, there are some countries where 70% of the nurses leave after they acquire their skills. Uh, we know that in the U.S., uh, certainly from my own experience in hospitals, I mean, you know, we, we have a lot of African and Asian and Latin American doctors and nurses helping us here in, in the U.S. And in fact, I think what we need, we desperately, the U.S., and so the same is true for Europe, needs them. But, the, but how, how should one think about it? How should one handle this? Um, should a country invest heavily in skilled labor and then see that skilled labor emigrate? Who, who captures then the returns on that investment? Anyway, there, there is, of course, an economic literature on this, but I think it needs to be deepened. And one has to be creative. For example, it may be worth considering a system where certain categories of skilled labor are invited by the academic system, as they are in the US, and even then can, you know, can spend some time. But then maybe some deal whereby that skilled labor is asked to return home, but not forever. Maybe for five years or eight years. And then if that skilled labor has done the work for five or eight years at home, maybe that's the best time to come say, okay, now you get your final immigration status, green card, we call it in the US or in Europe. Because you see, when families want to emigrate, it's very hard. I mean, they really want to do this. And I think it's part of globalization that it happens. And indeed, the skills are needed. And yet, they're also needed at home. Purely temporary worker permits are also maybe a useful element. But I, I believe a, a, a kind of long-term promise, actually, for some categories is more realistic and might actually m meet both the, domestic, uh, the needs in the advanced countries for, for these skills and at the same time, make sure that these skills are available at least for a period in the sending country. Uh, and and maybe, maybe everybody could be better off, the sending country, the receiving country, and the migrants themselves, if one could build an international system around such creative migration schemes. So migration, I think, is, is, is something that we, we need to look at very carefully in the context of the institution building uh, development assistance, development policies and development assistance um, that, that need to be pursued. Now, finally, before ending my remarks and leaving time for questions, these days I think one cannot and one should not leave aside the issue of climate, environment, and climate change. I must say, I must, I must confess, that five years ago, it was not much in my mind, quite honestly. I looked at some of my environmentalist friends as good, moral, ethical people, but some, somewhat in a, in a corner, in a niche, worrying a little bit too excessively about these environmental issues. Many of us coming from developing countries tend to say, ah, oh, environment is a little bit of a rich man's or rich woman's luxury. I mean, we first have to grow and, you know. I remember in Turkey when I was growing up, I mean, the... the symbol for development were factories with chimneys with, you know, polluting, <laughs> polluting stuff coming out of the chimney. But that was a good thing, you know, because you're industrializing. Now, I think we know much more now. And we know that the environmental challenge is, is very serious in terms of the quality of life, in terms of the pollution in many of the emerging market and, and developing countries. But now we've added a, another further major dimension to this, which is climate change. And we know that heat-trapping gases are truly accumulating, are truly changing the climate, and are posing problems which 10, 15 years, or even five years ago, many of us didn't really think about. The science, I think, has become quite overwhelming in the sense of saying, yes, there is global warming, and yes, it is, it is due to human activity. 
I don't think that the science is very clear in the exact way this will all play out. Uh, I, I, I think there's lots of uncertainty still in terms of what exactly will happen and how fast and what the feedback effects are and all that. So I, I don't want to sound as if you know everything was crystal clear and that we knew what was going to happen 30, 50, 60 years from now. There's also a lot of discussion and uncertainty relating, of course, to technology. Some technologies may become available that we don't even know about right now. However, there is climate change, and it, there are clear long-term dangers for everybody, including, <laughs> including the rich countries, dangers which we don't fully understand yet, but they're, they're there. And so if the world just was one big country of similar people, I would say I would look at climate change policy as basically an insurance challenge. There's a danger out there. You don't quite know what it's going to be, but it's kind of serious in the long term for your children and grandchildren. It makes sense to take out an insurance, to insure yourself against that, you know, e even if you don't know for sure. And I think if one, if one looks at it from an insurance point of view, then proactive mitigation policies and climate change policies make sense for the world as a whole and for the rich countries themselves. But apart from that, there's a very different dimension to climate change, and that is the immediate impact it is now having already today as we speak on the poorest countries. I've seen slides, again, you can see these slides these days, where, for example, the effects of climate change are geographically you know, analyzed for the next 20, 30 years, and it's quite clear and very sad that the negative impacts on agriculture Bill Klein has just come out with a book, Climate Change and Agriculture. Um, and, you know, on, 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 on weather events, extreme weather events, storms, floodings, the negative impact of climate change is going to be concentrated in the lower latitudes, exactly where today, unfortunately, the poorest people are living. Mo much of it in Africa, some of it in Bangladesh, parts of Asia, Caribbean, Pacific Islands. And, you know, to use the bottom billion kind of slogan, um, it's the, those same bottom million, roughly, that are going to face the impact of climate change. So, in fact, climate change is coming and, 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 and becoming another factor of divergence. The very people who are already not able to participate in globalization are going to be those, and are already those to some degree, but it's going to accelerate we're going to face tremendous climate change challenges. I think that's the way to think about it. You know, for, for you and me, if we live in Washington or New York or London even, or, or you know, certainly Moscow, you know, it's a long-term problem. Maybe something really bad will happen. We're not 100% sure. Let's take out some modest insurance against it. But if you bring in the development challenge, the bottom million, the poorest people in the world, it's a very, very immediate development problem. And, th and therefore, thinking about it, you know, a pure, a, a kind of pure economist who, or, or looking at it from a purely economics point of view, one would say, okay, we therefore have to mobilize resources for these climate affected countries on top of all the other resources that are being allocated for, and they're not enough, to fight against poverty and to include them in the world economy. And, and, and then in a sense, an additional transfer is now needed to take care of this over the next two decades. And I think that is largely correct. But sometimes the danger in economics, for those of you, you know, who've done economics courses, I mean, first best policies are always, you assume that the right transfer mechanisms and distributional mechanisms will take place. So if you follow that kind of model, you would do modest mitigation, because it's such a long-term problem, but for, you know, in, in, for, for, for ch citizens of Chicago, New York, or even Ankara in Turkey, or, you know, or, or Frankfurt in Germany, okay, take some insurance, and then you mobilize some resources and use these resources to help the poorest countries who are going to be the most affected by that. But in fact, mobilizing these resources and transferring is very difficult. 
we already have tremendous difficulties, you know, mobilizing the hundred billion dollars of ODA a year that, that, that's taking place now and just pre-climate change millennium development goals estimates, uh, you know, told us that we need at least 50 billion more a year, even without taking into account climate change. And now if we take into account the adaptation needs of climate change, we have another perhaps 30, 40, 50 billion needed for adaptation. So I think we're facing a huge problem of how the world is going to get organized, and it's a big problem I think for US policy also, to deal with this. And, and at the same time, I think we have to be very clear that if there's a major disaster somewhere, a big flood in Bangladesh, where 20, 30 million people are, I think, going to be very vulnerable to this, and, and, and the world hasn't done anything to help, this is going to be a huge ethical problem, but also a political problem. Because, you see, we now know that the heat-trapping gases that we emit are partly responsible for those events. It's one thing if you don't know or haven't focused on it. Then a flood is a flood, and you know you rush in humanitarian help, and, and maybe the story ends there. But I think at this point we know, and, and humanity and the world is waiting to, for the international community to get organized to deal with this, and deal with it, as I said, by a combination of mitigation policies and adaptation policies, because if you don't mitigate, then the adaptation costs and the costs that will hit the poor countries are going to be very, very large. Uh, I, I'd like to kind of end on, on, on that note, adding the kind of climate dimension to the human capital migration institution dimension we're dealing with. And concluding by, by saying that I think if you think of all these problems, and there are others, I mean, I haven't gone too much into the health and disease area, but that, of course, is another major area, and there is the more political issues of nuclear prol proliferation control, you know, terrorism, uh, fighting against terrorism, and things like that. But all these things, I think, demand very strong forms of international cooperation. Whether it's dealing with migration, whether it's climate change, we need the international cooperative mechanisms um, to address these issues. In technical language, we have these global goods and global bads, and countries per just acting by themselves will never be able to come up with the desirable and optimal arrangements. So there is need for cooperation, and, and therefore the challenge is how do we act individually as countries or as, as organizations, but how do we also really build the cooperative framework, the, the new forms of international cooperation to, to make it happen. It, um, it's interesting, I think, um, you know, we're in Washington now, uh, the IMF is getting a new chief, Dominique Strauss-Kahn. He just uh, two days ago wrote, was interviewed by Le Monde, I think he's very gung-ho, very enthusiastic, and has all kinds of proposals already on how to change governance and, and things of that sort. Um, Bob Zelik is, is the new president of the World Bank. Uh, we have a new secretary general at, at the UN, about six months ago. I think all these institutions really have to get together and have to think through how, how to build, uh, with the support of the member countries, of course, the efficient mechanisms of cooperation, of resource allocation that deal with these global, global public goods. On the US, it is a lead actor, of course. While it does not provide as much foreign assistance as other countries, in, as many other countries, such as Germany, France, UK, as a percent of GDP, but in, in total, of course, it does provide the largest amount of foreign assistance in the world. Um, on top of the official <laughs> assistance, there is a lot of philanthropy now. Philanthropy is really emerging as a major, uh, very significant source of funds, which, which needs to be added to the ODA kind of figures. Although still, the ODA is, of course, the largest figure. But I think philanthropy is growing. And yet, if everybody does it in a de totally decentralized way, if everybody does it without thinking the overall strategy, without trying to fight against duplication, and without, again, coming back to the beginning of my talk, realizing that resources are great, but if they don't come together with good policies and strong institutions, you know, they can also be wasted. So this is a time, I think, to think, think about all these things, to discuss 
I don't think there's a magic bullet, but I think we can do much better than we've done in the past because we've learned a lot. And in terms of the old tough ideological distinctions, they're not there anymore either. You know, in the old days, you either were a believer in free markets or in central planning, and the two kind of things just clashed. And that's now gone. Most people believe that in markets, and but they also believe that markets need some direction and some regulation to work. So I think the ideological atmosphere, in fact, is, po is, is conducive to greater cooperation. Uh, I, I think it's time to, to, to look into these things, both bur from a bureaucratic leadership point of view, but also from a conceptual point of view. And since I'm here in the smart power uh, uh, program, I would say that I think um, all of us who are interested in development really look forward to the US taking a very, very strong role as it did when the United Nations were founded, as it did with the creation of the Bretton Woods institutions, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a strong U.S. kind of role and, and leadership role in, in building these new structures of cooperation that focus on these issues and building in them in a way that they last and they don't just are something you do for a moment and then go, go on to something else, but you really do build lasting structures that can work in the long run. Thanks a lot. Okay, well, thank you very much. We have about uh, 40 minutes for questions, and um, I'd I guess I'd like to abuse my um, position here on the chair. It really just started out. Um, I'd like to press you. I mean, you raise a number of really fascinating challenges that the UN faces, and you do have a lot on your plate, um, obviously. But I'd like to press you a bit further on two aspects. I mean, I guess. There is a perception that the UN is a, uh, a slow to adapt institution, and now there is this, you, you talked a lot about globalization and, and how do we spread the, the impact of globalization to reach the, the world's poor. Uh, there's a new emphasis, of course, on user driven innovation in many parts of the world, and whether or not you have access to uh, the internet and to these new Web 2.0 tools or a cell phone, there's certainly a lot of amazing things that are going on in many parts of the world. So I'd like to really push you a bit more to see what UNDP plans on how do you plan on harnessing these new innovation tools to spread the benefits of globalization further on the one hand. Um, and the second point really relates to your, your focus on migration. Um, and you really talked a lot about the domestic institutions being very, very critical. Um, can you tell us a bit more, too, about how UNDP uh, plans on harnessing the, uh, the the massive amount of money that comes in through remittances to a number of these countries too. You know, the collective impact of remittances is, is quite extraordinary, 50 to 100 billion a year. We don't really know, obviously, the figures so well. Um, so maybe you could talk a bit more about your plans at UNDP to, to really try to work with alternative funding streams. All right. <laughs> Two <Thanks>. small questions. <laughs> <laughs> on, on the innovation, um, lots of things are happening. There was a fascinating article some weeks ago, and I think it was in the New York Times. I'm not sure. It may and might have been in Washington Post then, about how fishermen in East Africa use their cell phones mm -hmm. to create a much more competitive and efficient fish market. Because in the old days, without the cell phones, you know, you wouldn't know how much fish was being caught two, three hours uh, down south on the coast. And therefore, it, it, you know, some fish got wasted in one location where there wasn't enough fish in, on the other. And, and with cell phones now, there's a whole, you know, these fishermen, most of them probably are still illiterate and know very little. But they have learned how to use their cell phone to call each other and figure out where the, what's happening with the fish. And it's a, I thought it was a wonderful example of you know, how, the new, how, how, in a sense, some of the new technology <laughs> allows you to leapfrog development stages in, in the past. Another, uh, you know, another area which is quite well known is the, in the health sector, how uh, information sharing, global information sharing and advice is, is now available very quickly to practitioners, to doctors, uh, even in the, in the least developed countries. We are, uh, we are of course, uh, supporting that whenever we can. We have cooperative ventures. We raise money for these things. Uh, we always have to be very careful, you know, a big challenge for a public institution when it works with private products and, and, and companies is always you, you, you cannot be in a position where you 
advantage, you know, give advantage to one private product over another, because that has, you know, all kinds of <laughs> issues associated with it. But we are, for example, you know, we're not involved in development, but when the $100 uh, laptop, $100 laptop, uh, you know, will, will, will actually be mainstreamed, we certainly want to make sure that people can take the most advantage of it. Same, same goes for the cell phone technology, which is kind of competing a little bit with, with, with the $100 laptop. But there are other organizations, such as UNESCO, for example, or, or UNICEF you know, on the education side in the UN family, that uh, have even more specific focuses on, on these knowledge, knowledge products. In terms of the remittances here, you're absolutely right. I mean, remittances are now about, you know, certainly as important as official development aid. They're, 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 of course, used in a different way. And there are two big issues here, I think. One is the co bringing down the cost of transmit, transferring money. And it's amazingly high. I mean, I, 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 I've forgotten now. I don't have with me the exact numbers. But I think it's like, you know, sometimes people who transfer $200 have to pay $30 transfer fees. You know. There are also security issues involved. You know, money that finances illegal activities, drugs, terrorism, and all that. So, uh, making it very easy is, is is sometimes subject also to the to the need for international security. But certainly, ability to transfer money without high costs is a, is a great help, uh, and and helping the banking system do that, I think, is one of the activities. Um, various UN organizations involved, not so much UNDP as such as others. The other thing, of course, is the whole inclusive finance and microfinance. Mm -hmm. Because uh, a system where remittances just come you know, by wire transfer, and then somebody takes cash and stashes it under their mattress is one system. A system where actually remittances allow small savers to op open bank accounts, savings accounts, and develop the whole grassroots savings account system and banking system is, is, a, is much more useful. The percentage of people in poor countries who actually have bank accounts is still very, very small. Sometimes as, as little as 15% of the population. And so uh, developing, uh, using uh, the banking system much better, because then these savings can then translate into micro-investments, job creations, microfinance schemes, and so on. And here, UNDP is actually quite active, particularly via the UN CDF, which is a kind of part of UNDP, United Nations Capital Development Fund, which specializes on issues uh, of local finance, inclusive finance, and microfinance in the poorest countries. OK, great. Well, I'm sure we have a number of questions. Can you please uh, make sure you introduce yourself and, and the institution you come from? Yes, please. Oh, we need the microphones up here. Yeah, right in the front. And I'll try to get as many as I can. Maybe we'll take about two or three, and then you can answer yeah. them in questions. OK, that would be better, I think. Hi, thank you for an extremely fascinating presentation. My name is Mindy Reiser. I'm with the United Nations Association here of the National Capital Area. You're a former educator, and indeed, in your various positions, one might say you've continually been an educator. I want specifically to focus on human capital development and the role of education institutions across the world. We know in some countries, in some regions, the education systems, especially at the higher education level, are not what they once were. We know that UNESCO has education as its brief, but we also know the needs are very high. So I'm wondering, in terms of your convening power and your focus on collaboration, what you can do to encourage consortia of universities to work on development issues, how you can mobilize the UN university. It seems to me that's an area in terms of development and higher education that a lot more could be done. Sorry, I'll, I'll move to the back next. So, uh, right up here in the front row. Oh. Sorry, right up here in the front row. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much for your presentation as well. Can you um, introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Jahiri Galan. I am an intern in UNDP USA. And as a native of the, of the Dominican Republic, I was always um, wondering about the future of Haiti, which you um, mentioned. And um, my question is like, how can globalization help and contribute to this country? And whose responsibility is it to help? Is it the United States? Is it the neighboring country of the Dominican Republic, which is also a developing country? Um, or is it 
all the countries in the Latin American and Caribbean region. Um, what would you think about this? Okay, and the, the gentleman with the glasses, please. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, my name is Reinhard Marshall. I'm from the Netherlands Embassy. Uh, thank you for your most inspiring uh, words. Um, uh, you mentioned at the end of your speech the, the, the need for new structures of cooperation. Um, two years ago, we had the, uh, the, Par the Paris Declaration on, uh, on aid effectiveness, uh, in which uh, the USO DAC, uh, the OECD DAC countries, uh, 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 promise to harmonize their um, their efforts in development cooperation. Um, how do you see this uh, this uh, Paris Declaration uh, in this new structure of cooperation? And the second question: How uh, uh, do you think the UN itself can improve um, uh, the harmonization with the within its own agencies? Do you want to take these three? Or yeah. Okay. Maybe I take yeah. these three. <laughs> Because on the last one, I could give, <laughs> I would be, a, you know, able to talk for two, three hours in uh, UN, uh, UN reform, which is one of our big challenges. But l let me first say a few words on, on education. Um, in, in, in the whole analysis of, of, you know, what makes a difference, there's, there's no question that again and again, studies of human capital and of education have shown that that is one of the absolute leading factors of why one country does better than another. In, in many ways, the Asian, East Asian countries had one advantage over others, that their basic education systems were quite, a, quite good. So that while the Republic of Korea in the 50s had little industry and very low productivity economy, you know, primary basic education had, had, was there. And, and that, that is very important. There was... Um, one of the big issues, of course, is the balance within the education system. And here I would, I would say that on the whole, the, while, while of course primary education and literacy remains absolutely critical, and unless that's taken care of, uh, I think not, not much happens, there is now an increasing uh, stress on, on also on tertiary education and university. Because in today's technology world, you know, that, se that, that university sector is, must be emphasized also within the developing country education system. Now here, of course, the private sector has started to play a very, very important role. So it's not just a question of public sector, but private sector. And I, I, there are quite a few countries which have harnessed private sector initiative and, and, and resources in the tertiary sector, but have combined it, of course, with very um, important grants, education grants give, give, given to poor families. So I think this combination for the, for the university sector of bringing in private capital and private initiative, but, coupling, but accompanying it with generous uh, help for poor, poor students, poor family students, I think is very essential because otherwise it becomes a uh, elitist uh, sector. It becomes another source of social injustice and immobility. And indeed, it's not even very efficient because in terms of innate capacity, uh, kids from poor families uh, have as much as rich kids. And therefore, if you don't give them access, you actually are not using your potential sufficiently. So from a national strategy point of view, that's where I would come out. From an international um, corporate, cooperative kind of uh, arrangements, now of course the sky is the limit. I mean, soon I'm sure people will hear lectures from a professor in, in Delhi while they, you know, sit uh, in New Haven or, or in, 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 in Los Angeles, you know, and, and vice versa. So I think the, the, the new uh, technology allows an, an integration and the sharing of, of, of skills and experiences and, and of teaching capacities, which, which is, I think, only beginning to be exploited. I know UNESCO is doing quite a bit of work. We're not really involved as UNDP in that sector. Focusing on Haiti itself, it's uh, a very uh, sad story in a way, a country with tremendous culture and history and beauty and 
you know, wonderful people uh, has suffered so much, and also environmentally, it's one of the huge problems in, in Haiti is the environmental uh, you know, deforestation that has taken place. I, I, I do believe, however, that the most recent news are encouraging, that, uh, that uh, the institutions are beginning to function again. And um, I, I think that once the security situation and you know, law and order situation is, 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 has improved significantly, which it is beginning to improve, um, Haiti is, is in a part of the world where it can connect. It can connect to the rest of the Caribbean. It has, of course, many Haitians are in the US, I understand. There's a tremendous uh, scope for remittances. But one has to somehow jumpstart the process of growth. You know, uh, it, it's, it's one of those problems in many post-conflict countries that become very dependent on foreign aid and, and foreign presence is how do you move from that to a self-sustained self, uh, kind of growth. We, we had it in, in the Balkans. You know, we, we still have it in places like Kosovo and Bosnia, which for years now have, you know, have had a structure where the foreign presence is, is, is kind of most people work in that sector, and, and how to shift that to, to a self-propelled growth is, is, of course, very, very not, not easy at all. But it's one island, so I guess Dominican Republic and Haiti together should be able to do many joint ventures, many, many joint tourism ventures, uh, joint cultural things, and, and even joint industries. Now, the Paris Declaration and, and UN cooperation itself, I must admit, you know, as, as head of the UNDP, my other kind of hat and, and job is to try to chair the group of development institutions in the UN. <laughs> my colleagues are smiling because I say trying to chair, which is, has all kinds of challenges. One of them is geography because, you know, from Nairobi to Bangkok, I mean, we have offices all over the place. But it, it, uh, and I, and maybe I didn't emphasize enough uh, in, my, in my talk also in terms of the quality of aid, really the challenge, as the gentleman from the Netherlands Embassy has stressed, that harmonization and, and cooperation uh, presents us. We, we have a multitude of donor organizations, obviously. We have a multitude of bilateral organizations. Um, and yet when you visit, particularly some of the smaller countries, you know, many ministers, many counterparts have told me, even when I was at the World Bank, I don't, they say, you know, we, come on, we don't know what to do because this week we have basically five days, five, you know, different missions. One, one from the World Bank on Monday, then comes UNDP on Tuesday, then is you know the DFID and the Swedes are coming on Wednesday, and they all want to talk to me. And you know, this, the level of skilled counterpart is thin in many countries, so they all want to talk to the minister, to the director general, to, you know, and and they spend like eighty percent of their time dealing with these foreign missions. I mean, it's not a joke. It's really true. And, and it is a real problem. And therefore, great, greater coordination, greater cohesion in, in, in doing this and division of labor uh, between the agencies, is, is abs agencies and bilaterals, is, is extremely important. And yet, and yet, of course, you know, each one has their legitimacy. I mean, one particular European country, I mean, ne Netherlands is big in that sense because it's providing a lot of money. But you know, there are even very small ones that are will not give up their you know, their kind of uh, desire to, to be present as a bilateral agency. The taxpayer of you know of nowadays of the Czech Republic, let's say the Czech Republic is becoming a donor, you know, for following the European commitments. Well they, they want the Czech activities and I think that that's understandable. And the same goes within the UN family. Uh, you know, the worst thing that happens if you forget to CC somebody on your email, you know, you, you immediately have reactions. So, so uh, we, we do have uh, this, this challenge of how to kind of organize this whole system in a, in a much more effective way. I think we made some progress. Donors have gotten organized under the Paris Declaration. Some procedures have been harmonized. Some donors are saying, okay, we, we're going to con concentrate on, on this country, you, you concentrate on the other. Some donors are concentrating on sectors and, 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 and others on other sectors. So there has been some progress, but it is very, very difficult and, and sometimes extremely frustrating, to, to be honest. But when I get really frustrated, which happens, unfortunately, sometimes, I remember my days 
um, when I was, I actually represented Turkey in the Convention for the Future of Europe, in the European parliamentary you know, group that tried to uh, formulate the so-called new European constitution, which was an exciting task. But you know, at that time Europe was just still 15 and heading towards 25 and then 27. And it's so difficult, even within the European context, you know, when you now have 27 members to somehow get it organized, you know. And then when you think of the UN with 192 members, uh, you kind of take a deep breath and it's a long-term project, you know. And, and yet it's important. Yet, yet it's important. I'll share with you one experience I had in the European Parliament. I was walking around and I actually he heard that criticism in New York also coming from some people, you know. And you have all these translators, and you look at the translation budget, and it's huge. I mean, in, in the European Commission in Brussels, in the European Parliament. The other uh, you know, thing is that people actually, many people speak very good English, okay? But when they take the microphone, you know, it's whatever national language their, their country is coming from. And, you have, and then you have all these translators madly translating all these national languages. And of course, they, you know, it's not easy, and it costs money and all that kind of thing. But, you know, so one day I was walking in the corridors of the European Parliament kind of saying, I mean, there's a lot of waste here, you know. And then, however, I thought, well, think about it. Europe was tearing itself apart. Tens of millions of people killed. Huge armament expenditures. I mean, you know, if bringing people together means you have to translate and pay some translators and a little bit of waste and a little bit of excess space so that everybody can kind of interact that's a small price to pay to avoid war and avoid you know, conflict. So I think one has to also look at it from that point of view. A little bit of inefficiency and you know, a little bit of um, high cost activities, but with the overall result that people talk to each other, work together, try to work out their differences, try to find compromises. Not a bad investment, I think, overall. Okay, well, let's take some questions from the back of the room, maybe. Um, Oh, Johanna, over there. Uh, thank you. Johanna Mendelson, four minutes, CSIS. And I'd like to talk to you about Haiti, but on a separate uh, dialogue, okay. uh, because I don't share your view. I work for the UN MINUSTA, and uh, it's an issue. But uh, I really want to bring up your point about climate change, because certainly it's a major issue for UNDP. But one thing that I thought you might link and may want to discuss is the connection between migration and climate because environmental migrants have become perhaps one of the key problems, not only in sub-Saharan Africa, but around the world. And with sea level rising, it's become a major issue. And it's certainly one of the great issues with north-south immigration policies. And I was wondering how you thought UNDP and its sister agencies might be able to address something that has its roots in development as far as mitigation is concerned. Thank you. More from the back of the room? over there, military fellow. Hi, I'm uh, Dan Murphy, a military fellow here at CSIS. I, I really liked your comment about it's easier to build a road than set up institutions. And it, it kind of got me thinking about uh, some models for foreign aid in terms of uh, a country like China that's seemingly very willing to build a road or a power plant, uh, but very unwilling to get their hands dirty in the internal politics or building liberal institutions. So I was just wondering what UNDP's role is in that and how you see the possibility to encourage them to be a little more forward, forward thinking in that regard. Okay, and someone up here, one to, um, yeah, gentleman here, please. Thank you. Ed Berger, the Eurasian Medical Education Program. I was going to, wanted to address the issue of conditionalities, which accompany much foreign assistance. <clears throat> and I'll offer two anecdotes which perhaps illustrate the point. One was a meeting several months ago of uh, a number of high-level people on the subject of health in New York. And the very stately Minister of Health from Kenya stood up. <coughs> uh, the President of the World Bank was on the stage at that point, and she said, let me tell you about the problem of conditionalities. One of the conditions in our case is that we're supposed to try to reduce public expenditures. We produce a lot of nurses, but we can't hire them, and so we're exporting them to your country. And the other is that, in practice, patients who come into the hospital have to pay the bill before they leave the hospital. In practice, what that has meant is that 
women come in to deliver and pass their babies out the windows to their husbands and then are captive in the hospital until they can pay the bill. Um, the other anecdote had to do with conversation with, on the subject of Mongolia not too long ago, in which the Mongolian spokesman said, one of the, one of the um, advantages of taking money from China at this point is that there are no conditionalities. And of course, that's not unrelated to the very large amount of trade between China and Mongolia. And I think a um, <clears throat> perhaps speaks to your point about uh, relying heavily upon the indigenous country to, uh, to uh, be involved in how the monies are used. I'd, I'd love to have your thoughts on how that balance pipe should be, should be looked upon. On the environmental migration issue, I, I think it, it really is going to be a, really a very serious issue. I mean, some, some, some environmental migration is going to be unavoidable. Past uh, climate change and, and greenhouse gas emissions have created a situation where no matter what we do, even if we take drastic mitigation measures, there will be in the next 15, 20 years, uh, some island states and some other place, parts of the world that will face some very severe damage and, and some, you know, sea level rise. I mean, we're already committed to a certain amount of sea level, sea level rise. We don't know maybe whether it's going to be 20 centimeters or 30 or 40, but, you know, some of it is definitely going to affect some communities. Um, and, and, you know, in, in some extreme cases, uh, I think... Uh, there will be no other choice but to accommodate some, some migrants, either internally within their own countries or, or internationally. But I do believe politically this whole issue of environmental migration, of course, is, is a powerful topic because migration is, you know, as I mentioned, is such an important phenomenon in, in modern times and has always been, I mean, in the past also, in the 19th century, after all, we, we also had, had massive migration. And, and, and yet, uh, in, in terms of accommodation, in terms of social systems, in terms part of the problem, in the, uh, part of the situation in the past, of course, is because social welfare systems were not developed. You know, and migrants came, but it didn't pose the same political problems of insiders, outsiders. Uh, that the, the, the insiders that are benefiting from an education system, a health system, and whatever, uh, even if they have been migrants 10 years ago themselves, you know, are always looking at new migrants as a potential threat to, to certain benefits. So there, there is always going to be that tension and therefore uh, interaction between social welfare policies and social security policies and migration is going to be very much on, on the agenda. I think, as I said, the, the whole migration issue and climate change issue is going to build a very strong case for uh, both mitigation and foreign aid to help in the adaptation process. And I, as I said, I don't think one can put the whole weight on adaptation because those transfers simply won't become feasible. And therefore, some mitigation may be necessary, even purely from a development point of view, even if we, if we disregard the long-term risk to the, to the advanced countries themselves. The issue of, I mean, the two last uh, f uh, further questions were actually to some degree uh, related. And you'll understand that as a UNDP official, I mean, I'm not going to make value judgments on, on one country or, or another. But the, the issue of conditionality of aid uh, is, has been, you know, has been tremendously tricky and tremendously debated. And the way I come out on it is, again, to say that if conditionality is imposing some outside values or experiences or institutions on countries without adapting them or without making a very serious effort to adapt them to local circumstances and history, it really doesn't work, even with the best of intentions. I mean, sometimes the intentions may not even be that good, you know, but even with the best of intentions, it, it backfires. There is need for what we call national ownership. There is need for countries to, to feel that they are the ones developing their policies and their institutions. And uh, in, in that sense, the kind of conditionality which, which disregards that and, 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 and conditionality in its poor, 
pure form, I, I don't think works. On the other hand, transferring resources into any kind of environment clearly also doesn't work. So there, there is need for responsible uh, foreign aid policies to take into account the environment, the, the institutions, the policies uh, where the monies are deployed. I mean, in the extreme case of massive corruption, for example, I mean, which has been the case in, you know, in some of the uh, past, it is quite possible for foreign aid to be given to a country just to immediately travel out again without absolutely no effect on the, on the development of the country. And we've had examples of, of that. Uh, so engaging the country and, and, and discussing strategies with the country and, and, and asking the country to explain how things will, will work, I think, is valid. And then to, 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 really, um, to really be aware that circumstances are very different. That what may be a good thing, like you know, making sure that uh, a mother pays the hospital <laughs> before she leaves, in, you know, in certain circumstances may not work and may actually create strange effects. Uh, you know, if one doesn't have a payment plan that is more appropriate to that particular situation. I also, in my own life, have experienced situations where very well-meaning foreign advice that came even when I was in government in Turkey, really missed some of the key facts, you know, and, 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 and it, it, takes a, it, it takes a long time to, to kind of find the right way to explain these facts. So it is the interaction between the national, national capacity and national capability and the foreign advice and the resources. I think it's, it, it's in that interaction that the best results come forward. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's not something, there's no recipe. I, I can't uh, be, be much more precise than that. But, but if the national capacity isn't there, um, then whatever you do, you end up making a mistake. If you impose conditionality, it doesn't work. But if you don't impose it, it also doesn't work. So I think, that, you know, the focus on building the national capacity is very important. Now, it took the rich country donors, the traditional donors, a very long time to get to the Paris Declaration, to start, uh, you know, providing foreign aid that, that really focuses on institution building and so on. So I, I do believe in it as a general statement that it will be good if all donors join these mechanisms of cooperation and because there are lots of lessons that have been learned, lots of lessons that can be shared. And in, in that sense, the new emerging donors, I mean, we, we hope that they will become part of all these cooperative mechanisms. On the other hand, we also shouldn't be too surprised that that will take some time, that it took, you know, it took the European countries uh, or the US a very long time to get to the point where we are today. And even, even now, there's still a lot of tide aid and things which, which are not really what they should be. So um, I mean, the bottom line is I, I do believe that if the emerging market countries, such as China and India and Mexico, Brazil, Turkey, Republic of Korea, these are emerging donors, uh, join the effort, that's basically a good thing. It will take some time to then also get them to join the harmonization effort. And finally, let me say one thing. We've learned in the past, and, and some of these you know, effectiveness studies of aid have, have, have kind of not focused on that point, I think. If you focus your foreign assistance on purely political objectives, or military objectives. You may achieve your political or military objectives, but that's very, very different from focusing foreign assistance on development. And during the Cold War, I think what happened is that both sides, the priority was the politics and the geostrategy, and the priority was to make sure that a particular country didn't fall into the zone of influence of the opposing power. And so a lot of the foreign assistance that was deployed during the Cold War had very kind of um, strategic political objectives, and development was, much, was, was not really the major objective. So then to analyze the effectiveness of development aid, when in fact it wasn't development aid, you know, is kind of not uh, very valid. 
I, 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 I know that one American president used, I mean, I'm not going to use the sentence, but I think it's a famous sentence, you know, he's a very bad guy. I know, but he's our guy, so, you know, why don't we, why don't we continue supporting? And, of course, the Soviets did the same with their allies uh, very often, you know. And, and in that kind of atmosphere, uh, obviously, if you're going to measure the, the effectiveness of development resources, you're not going to get very good results. So in the whole business of eva evaluating development efforts, I think one has to, be, one has to make uh, provision for that and uh, take into account. We, one also, for example, shouldn't, uh, analyze the development impact of disaster relief. Because obviously disaster relief goes to mitigate the disaster, not to create development. It's a little bit like uh, looking at the health performance of people who take strong antibiotics and, and those who don't, you know, and then finding that, uh, that in fact those who don't do better. So antibiotics are not useful. I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but the point is somebody takes an you know, strong medicine when they're sick. Uh, and if you're not sick, you don't need it. But you can't conclude from there that the medicine isn't useful. And some of the, uh, you know, some of the empirical analysis, the early empirical analysis of aid, stressing that it wasn't effective, actually sometimes uh, made, made those mistakes. So I think with that, we have to close, yeah. because I'm, I have to catch a flight to, to Mozambique tonight. Look forward well, to that. Well, thank you very much. I yeah. promised Dr. Dervish that he would get his flight out of here. So um, just on behalf of Dr. Hamry and the Smart Power Project, I'd like to thank you for a really fascinating discussion today and, and answering the questions. So thank you thank very you much. Very much.